welcome to our interview with Frans Muller, CEO of Aarhus de Herse. The holding group has 400,000 employees, serves 55 million customers weekly and owns 19 brands in 11 countries. The brands you are all probably most familiar with uh, are the Netherlands own Albert Heijn, Bol.com, Gal Gal, Ethos and more. Um, they are also a dominating force at the east coast of America. As always, with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, so today we want to talk about Alhot's responsibility with regards to three topics. Uh, sustainability, competition and the future of retail. Um, in all these challenges, Alhot has a lot of weight to throw around, which is why we're incredibly excited to have him here on the stage today. So please give a very warm welcome to Franz Müller. Uh, Thank you. Hi. And if you want to have a seat here. Thank you. <coughs> so, welcome uh, Mr. Miller. Um, we're super happy that you, uh, you are here. How do you like uh, our campus? Yeah, it's super. It's super to be here with uh, all those talents here in Amsterdam. And it's a great opportunity to, uh, to get hopefully in a good dialogue with all of you because uh, this is also important for our company from a curiosity point of view. And, 41% of all the associates in our company, 41% are Gen Z, to those uh -huh. folks which are 25 years or younger. So uh, yeah, I'm with an important uh, target group here for the future, so it's nice to be here. You, uh, you studied yourself in Rotterdam, does it feel then a bit uh, awkward to be in Amsterdam or are you also comfortable here? No, I'm, I'm, I'm not so much in the, in the telephone numbers with no T and no Twinty <laughs> and kind of things. So I feel very comfortable here and uh, as you know, or as you might know, I'm also chairman on the business school in Belgium. Um, because for me, education is important. So it's, be, it's nice to be in Amsterdam on the UVA, but I'm also pretty at home in Rotterdam too. Okay, well, being at home is an is a important part of your job, I would say, because you uh, are, of course, in 11 countries at the same time. Um, and uh, those 11 countries, you have 19 local brands. Uh, do you feel when you wake up in the morning that you have to split your brain into 19 pieces? No, the, the 19 local brands uh, on the east coast of the US, we have roughly 60% of our business in Europe and Indonesia, roughly 40%. And on my brain, when I wake up, is more the customer in general, and the customer wishes and requirements and ideas are more similar than people sometimes think. And we might talk about a few things today. Yeah. Um, so it's more, uh, what can we do on our customer value proposition? And uh, how can we uh, enhance this? If it's digital, if it's uh, omni-channel, if it's organic, if it's healthy, if it's affordable. These things are more on my mind than the 19 brands individually. Mm. So, as you mentioned, the majority of your revenue comes from the US. Um, in Ahol's future, do you think you will be focused on the US, the EU, Asia, or something else? We feel very comfortable with uh, the portfolio of the US and Europe together. Uh, I don't see ourselves in Latin America, Africa, or deeper down in, in Asia. Mm. Um, we think that uh, we have plenty of growth opportunities in the US, and also the European uh, continent is still big enough for us to grow, if it's digital, if it's omni-channel, so online and, and stores. Uh, and there's still quite some interesting markets, uh, both in the US and in Europe. Mm. But plenty of growth in the, in the geographies we know a little bit better. Okay, nice. So uh, I think we would like to start off talking a little bit about your uh, e-commerce business. So we actually want to ask the audience here, uh, by show of hands, how many of you have shopped at Gold.com this month? This month? This month, okay. Ah, quite a yes. lot, it's quite a lot of people. Ah. And now the tricky part, how many of you shopped at Amazon.com this month? It's a little bit less. It's uh, that's according to the market uh, yeah. market share developments, by the way. So, we Amazon is of course a um, very respected competitor, as you all can imagine. Uh, with Bol.com, we are roughly two and a half times the size of Amazon for the Netherlands. But it's hard work to to stay ahead of them. It's yeah. a good competitor, and that's why our teams are pretty on their toes. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, we actually wanted to ask about that. So uh, Amazon is your fastest rising competitor here uh, in the Dutch market, although as you said, you still like totally dominate, actually. Um, how do you make sure that companies go to Bold.com instead of Amazon? 
Uh, the, the word domination is a bad word for the antitrust authorities, as you all know. Uh, uh, the bad word, but um, so we are happy with our leadership position in the Dutch market. But again, it's hard work. So what makes us different is uh, that we know the, the Dutch customer very well. Uh, I think you hopefully you recognize that our last mile fulfillment and reliability is very good, on-time delivery, uh, but also the last mile is of, of very good quality. And I think we have a lot of um, vendors, uh, suppliers on our network. We have 50,000 different vendors on the Bol.com network mm -hmm. who also know the Dutch consumer, the Dutch market very well. So I think we have a, a great offer. And if you look for toys over Christmas, then we have a great toy book. Yeah. If you look for the Black Friday week, it's coming up the last week of November. Hopefully we, hopefully we do a good job for you also that we have a lot of choice and that the price value is uh, to your liking. But still, um, uh, in two years, Amazon has risen to the number four spot uh, in the e-commerce Dutch market. Um, how long do you think it will take for you um, uh, or for them to overtake Bol.com? Yeah, I, do, I don't have a crystal ball, but that is not on our plans, by the way. So um, we have a, a two, we have two and a half times the size of Amazon, but I think a competitor like Amazon is never to be underestimated. So we have to make sure that we are having the best customer proposition, assortments, online fulfillment delivery, uh, pricing, uh, and that we make the right choices. And, and uh, will you be able to deliver on that um, uh, even if you don't have the skill that uh, Amazon has? Yeah, I think so. Uh, at the moment we still gain market share with Bol.com. Amazon is also gaining share in the Dutch market. Market data, I think you may be deeper into this in your studies, but the market data, uh, the Nielsen GFK data type of things for the e-commerce market in the, in the Netherlands is not so rich. Yeah, it's still very early times for market data. But both brands uh, gain share. And I'm pretty sure that we stay ahead of the game because we know our markets and our customers very well. And with um, 20 million products on the Ball.com network with 50,000 vendors, uh, and with a very strong fulfillment product, I think we have a very strong proposition. In the same ranking, this year there was a new number two. Do you know who it was? A new number two on yeah. the e-commerce online frame. Yeah. In the Dutch market. In the Dutch market. I think you might say maybe Alibaba. Uh, it was Albert Heijn. Yeah, <laughs> but that's, that, that is not in the general merchandise. Eh? No. That is in the food business. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, So, so that, that, that raised the questions with, uh, with us. Uh, are we moving towards uh, e-commerce and food retail as well? Is that a strategy you are currently implementing? Yeah, but that's already for 10 years our strategy. We believe that um, if you come to work and you pick up your cappuccino, or if you come to the university and pick up your cappuccino in the morning with a to-go shop of Albert Heijn, um, when you order, make an order for an Albert Heijn order online, or when you go in the weekends, hopefully, to our stores, that all those customer journeys, how we call them, under one brand, that is a strong proposition. And uh, that's what we are working on. And we have now one and a half billion sales of Albert Heijn in the Netherlands, with a roughly 50% market share. Yeah. But it's hard work, eh, because e-commerce for us is still loss-making in food. Mm. So it's dilutive to your total profitability. But we believe that the customer relationship in those various customer journeys together under one brand is in the end a strategic strong positioning and that's why we call this omni-channel. Yeah, um, we see that move in a lot of different branches. Yeah. Of course, you're a very diverse company. Do you see an omni-channel future for Aholder Heads? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's, we, have, we have at the moment a, a 10 billion uh, online sales, which is uh, uh, 12% over our total company sales. And uh, we believe strongly in omni-channel, that the combination of stores and online is, is the best way uh, we can serve you in the best possible uh, potential way. So in the US we have an, uh, a 3 billion sales, which is roughly 7% penetration of online in the total business. Albert Heijn has roughly 11% e-commerce share in the food business. And we have of course Bold.com here as well. So now we believe fully in omni-channel, it's our strategy. Mm -hmm. And uh, how will competition between companies uh, be different when it, uh, uh, when the, when it is uh, omni-channel based uh, shopper experience? It's different because we invest in, uh, in, the, in the different journeys, in the different fulfillment ways to make it as easy for you, as seamless for you and as, uh, as transparent for you as possible. And that's what we try to do in all the markets. And I think we think that 
you don't have enough time or our consumers do not have enough time to make it easy on payments or on understanding on loyalty programs which are connected yeah. with all the journeys that's what we believe and that is also when you talk to Alibaba's of this world uh, and we talk to them regularly because they're also strong competitors in the few markets then they came from the online and they're building stores oh. Alibaba yeah? we come from the stores and building online but in the end it's it's migrating migrating towards each other so mm -hmm. both companies yeah. with very different heritage have in the end the same type of omni-channel proposition I think that's I think that's what we think you you're looking for and what our customers are looking for so that is a part of our plan yeah of course um so i must say like as a consumer when i hear these companies talk about their only channel um, ambitions uh, for example apple i feel like uh, the goal is kind of for me as a consumer to be pulled into this company sphere the company universe and then stay there so I was wondering uh, if you think that omnichannel um, markets are a little bit more sensitive towards like monopolistic tendencies, for example. No, we, we grow uh, organically and uh, we would like to make sure that you can make your choices. And when we have a very competitive set of propositions, online to go and stores, we hope that you get more satisfied and what we see in those relationships that the total share of wallet, how we call this, that the total share we get of your disposable income for groceries is getting bigger mm -hmm. when we get an online proposition together with stores. That's And that's also proving it out now, so that, that's what we see now. Yeah. It's not meant to be to be monopolistic, it's not meant to be to reduce your choice, you are a free person, you decide yourself. And, and um, but we have to be convincing, we have to be a service orientation, the right assortment, the right freshness, the right product, the private labels, and all this kind of thing. So that is as hard work in the store as it will be online. Of course. Then it is time for the first uh, audience questions. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand and um, a colleague of us will go. You're the first uh, there. In the middle, yeah. next to... Uh... And then you, sir. Uh, yeah. I have a question for you. Today, your company spends 991 million on stock buybacks. During the pandemic, you spent billions to buy out your competitors. Barely any of your stores are being closed. Many early, barely any employees are being laid off. Your dividends are ever high. Your investors are not paying out of pockets. You yourself get more than four million in salary before bonuses and golden parachutes. The prices in your stores are high and ever rising. Where are these millions coming from, if not our lunch money? <laughs> yeah, nice it's reference to our title. <laughs> yeah. No, it is, uh, thanks for the question. And uh, I understand also the background of your question. It's quite simple in itself. All our revenues come from households, persons like you, and your lunchbox. Uh, that is the only revenue stream we have for the total company. And uh, we have to make sure that we make this lunch walk as effective, as diverse, as healthy, and as affordable as possible. That's why we are in business. We are 150 years in business, and uh, that's uh, one of the main drivers, or the main driver of our total company is to make sure when we talk about food for the moment, talking about the lunch walks, that we make it healthy and affordable and sustainable as possible. And the second driver we have in the total company is that we also work our heart ourselves to make the total food chain as durable, as sustainable as possible. And uh, so, answer to your question, where is the money coming from? The money coming is from our customers, so that's the only source of revenue we have. Customers that can barely afford to eat in these times. Sorry, that... Yeah. Um, well, we don't really do second questions, uh, so uh, if you have a question, you can ask it afterhand. Let's uh, first give everyone else a turn. So, any other audience questions? Um, can we uh, come over here? Yes, you. Okay, hi. Um, so, I'm from Indonesia and um, Del Hai's own Super Indo in Indonesia. And something I want to ask is like a lot of people um, think that companies that you own such as Super Indo or like 
I even talked to some Serbians who think that some supermarkets in Serbia are actually local brands, but then actually it's owned by the Highs, which is a Belgian brand. What do you think about how the Highs is actually having like a monopoly in the world in the supermarket industry? And um, what do you think, like, do you have any opinions about that and how it might be problematic or not? Terima kasih for your question. Um, so, um, monopoly is a, is a strong word, right? Um, in Indonesia, to be honest with you, we have uh, 220 supermarkets under the uh, super, super Indo brand. We are very proud to bring a contribution to Indonesia. We're mainly on the island of Java, we have two, store, two stores in Sumatra. Um, and we are recognized as the, one of the best supermarkets in Indonesia, fresh assortment, sustainable, durable and price. Uh, we're the market leader uh, on the island in the supermarket segment, not in the convenience segment and not in the hypermarket segment, because you know there are a lot of other players there. So uh, it's our job to make sure that we can serve as many customers as possible. And we are also in Indonesia for almost 20 years. We just celebrated that 20 years jubilee. Um, we are a good employer there. I think we have a nice proposition and very proud about that. So uh, thanks for your question. And uh, we grow organically. And if you talk about acquisitions, then of course we obey all the rights of antitrust and these kind of things. Otherwise we don't get the approvals from the authorities. Okay, um, who else has a question? We will also have opportunities later during the interview, so you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, can we go to the gentleman in glasses? Uh, I read in the Q3 report, and I quote, we also took important steps to bolster our digital advertisement capabilities, by, for example, the acquisition of a minority stake in SMEs. My question is, how does AHOL see itself in the advertisement business? Yeah. Thank you for the question. That's a very strategic question at the same time. Um, you can imagine that um, there are a lot of companies who would like to use uh, advertising data to, uh, to run their products better, and we would like to be stronger in understanding customers better. What is the con condition for all these kind of elements to use data that we get your consumer customer consent? Uh, so we are, of course, obeying the law in the markets where we work, and consent and GDPR in Europe is a very strong legislation. So we work by, by legislation and following the law, we receive nice opportunities for ourselves to use the data better, to make a better proposition, better products for you. Uh, but also advertising companies would like to uh, work more on a personalized base, more directed and marketed, surgically targeted marketing. So we, use with those we work with those companies. We see for ourselves a data monetization income revenue stream of 1 billion by 2025, which is a new type of stream in the markets of retailers. Uh, and uh, we developed therefore tools and partnerships and this partnership is with Atis, a company from Belgium uh, who is very specialized with good algorithms to understand customers better. What is important to know, and I mentioned this earlier, we only can do this when, when we get your approval and your consent, what we can do and how we can use data, that's a condition for us. But I think we can also therefore um, make it easier for you that you get hyper personalized offers or that we understand you better as a customer and we can make some recommendations and so give you some ideas to have an even healthier or more affordable life so important business for us and to work, to work with the fmcg suppliers and retailers um, this is an important instrument for the future monetization data monetization and using this as a complementary revenue stream for ourselves Thank you very much, um, and thank you, audience, for your nice questions. The gentleman here in front. Uh, we will have another round of audience questions. Okay, later. good, all right. Um, so, uh, we're all students here, uh, as you know, or at least most of us, and most of us are also very concerned about our environment, yeah. about the climate, um, and I bet you that like at least a third of people here are like flexitarian, vegetarian, or vegan, mostly with the uh, motivation to protect our planet. I'm vegetarian myself. And I wonder, have you ever felt pressure or drawn inspiration from your sons who are around our age uh, when it comes to making your own like, good environmental choices? Yeah, my, my sons, uh, who are roughly in your age group, uh, having the same concerns, but I, I'm also very concerned myself. 
Yeah, no, of course. So, um, I'm very concerned myself about climate, the developments there, the choices that we make, and it's even for, more for us, for myself and my generation, to make the right decision so that the next generations uh, uh, don't have uh, the, the conflict and the pain uh, we might have caused. I mentioned 41% of our total Emporia base is Gen Z, yeah. so they have a very strong voice in our company too, what is important for them. and but. What is important for them is also very important for myself. Um, we set uh, a long time ago, ago already uh, our sustainability targets uh, on food waste, on plastics, on healthy sales, but also on diversity and inclusion, which is also a very important target for our company. And you can imagine with 420,000 people, it's so important to have a more inclusive company and that we also serve diversity in all its elements but also on climate, and we might talk about it later. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah there it comes. Yeah, so uh, scope one, two, and three is important to us as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, when it comes to, to the environmental policy, and we'll, we'll talk about scope three in a minute, what is the one environmental area where you outperform all your competitors? Um, we outperform all our we have, a, we have a number of healthy and sustainable targets. Yeah. So where we're really much better than a lot of our competition is our percentage of healthy sales. And healthy sales over private label is what we score our products with, with the elements like Nutri-Score. If you shop our store, this is the Nutri-Score label on the products, yeah. A, B, C, D. We have definitely seen that, yeah. Pardon? No, we, we see it when we go yeah. out of time. Yeah, so we're very high on that percentage. Um, I think we do an excellent job uh, also on uh, food waste. We also we are not the best in class, but we make very good progress there. We have high targets on our 100, 100, 100 strategy on diversity and inclusion, 100% gender balanced, 100% representation of our neighborhoods. So and you would say uh, food waste, healthy choices, and diversity. And diversity and inclusion, yeah. Three strong areas. Yeah, yeah. Right. Those are strong areas. In general, we are number one diversity, or number one Dow Jones Sustainability Index, okay. and the MSCI, which is a metrics of Morgan Stanley, and we also a double A company. Yeah, wonderful. So um, you know your own books best, so to speak. You know, you know your own operation best. So what would you say is the one area where you have the most room for improvement? It's the area of plastic. Plastic? Yeah. And uh, packaging? Is it in the supply chain? Where does it uh, show? No, I think on packaging recycling, when we talk about carton and paper, we do a pretty good job. But plastics is uh, one of our weak points. It's an industry weakness, unfortunately. Uh, it, we, we've got ourselves plastic on recyclable, compostable and uh, reusable. Uh, and we see now that as a total industry, retailers but also suppliers, we failed so far. Mm. We are a member of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation for Plastics. And uh, the targets we set ourselves are proven too, too, ambitious, uh, too ambitious because it's so complex the whole chemistry of plastics that certain plastics do not come together and you cannot recycle them. So we're now studying with the whole industry how can we get uh, progress there because the idea that there might be more plastics in the oceans than fish is of course a terrible, uh, terrible outlet. Yeah, it is indeed. Um, today you made a huge announcement, and before we can talk about it, could you briefly explain what Scope 3 means? Yeah, that's, uh, I'm happy to do so. Scope 3 is maybe not on your daily studies when you study uh, PPLE or when you study German, uh, then uh, Scope 3 is maybe a new phenomenon. Um, there is an institute which is governed by the United Nations and it's called SPTI, Science Based Targets Institute. An institute which measures targets with data and is objective. In that SPTI um, company or association, scope one and two is how, we, how they measure companies like us on our own operations talking about CO2 emissions. And scope three is how they measure us, our contribution in the total supply chain. The food supply chain is roughly 30% of the worldwide CO2 emissions. That's a big, big number. So we are in the food supply chain. We are asked, we are requested uh, to bring a contribution. Scope 1 and 2 is ourselves. Scope 3 is the total supply chain of food in our case. Mm. And today you made an announcement that Albert Heijn, uh, I must say, um, that you will move your scope 3 um, target for um, the reduction of emissions to 45%, which is nearly threefold of what you were planning to do. 
uh, before 2030. Um, and of course, that, that when you read it, you think, well, great. Um, and we were wondering, um, did you also consider maybe doing that for Aldo Hesse as a whole? Yeah, it's a question I can fully understand. So Albert Heijn is really front runner uh, in the Dutch market, but also internationally they do a, an excellent job. So uh, they announced today the 45% scope free CO2 reduction yeah. uh, by 2030. Yeah. But they also gave you the information that they're already in their own business for 90% uh, energy neutral with solar, wind energy and these kind of things. So they are the front runner also in our company. And we are working now to come back to our audiences, that is customers, associates, and shareholders, with our targets for the total company, for the group. Yeah. And we're going to do this by the end of November, so by the end of this month. Okay, so there may, might be a new announcement. There is very likely to be a new announcement. Uh, so far we set 15% by 2030, uh, and we think we have to up that, we have to increase that commitment for two things, for the percentage, but also for the one and a half degrees. Because initially we were on two, two degrees, and we all know that two degrees is not good enough anymore for this planet. Uh, and we go now to, to one and a half degrees global warming, which is... In do, do, do you feel confident when you, when you put out releases like this that you will actually be able to, to reach them? I feel confident, but the scope three is the total food chain. Mm -hmm. Of this total food chain, we take 5% ourselves. Our scope one and two is 5% of the total chain. So we have to work and convince other players in yeah. the total food chain that you as consumers downstream, yeah. because you also have food waste, which is also not good for the environment, but also with the farmers and with the manufacturers and the fertilizer producers, to bring their scope one and two to the table to feed the total total scope three. It's a little bit complex, but so just to clarify. So I feel confident, but it's hard work. Yeah, okay, great. Just to clarify on the consumer side. Uh, correct me, correct me if I'm wrong. End use of your products is five percent of your scope three emissions. No, the our own operations. So and our own energy, yeah. our own transportation, how we run our stores, yes. and refrigerants. That's five percent. Ninety-five percent. That is scope three. 5% of that is on the consumer side. This is what I read on your website, but... No, I think you have not, you could not be able to read that, I think. And do you know the number? Yeah, the total food waste, for example, in the total chain, from production farmer up to your kitchen, is 30% food waste uh, total. And of that, of that percentage, roughly half of that is in your, in your control. Mm -hmm. So we have to work very hard also with consumers and with our assortments portion control, how can we help you get more shelf life, how can we get the products longer fresh, yeah. so that you don't have to waste products. And that's a job for us to do, but also get more communication with customers, what can you do to reduce your own food waste yourself, because it's a big component as well. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so um, something that we also noticed uh, when we read about your environmental policies, you actually have a lot of them, you make pledges uh, on biodiversity, on deforestation, uh, and more. Uh, but a lot of it is targeted at your own brand product. So for the audience, that would be like if you buy Albert Heijn yogurt instead of some other yogurt, uh, that is where the pledges are actually uh, relevant Maybe. for. Exactly, and I was wondering, what is the rationale behind this? Why not make the same pledges for all of your products? I think that's a super question and a very understandable uh, angle. We, we started to make those pledges for our private label, the products we produce ourselves, which are our own uh, products, which we can completely control uh, the whole life cycle. In Albert Heijn, 50% of our total sales, Albert Heijn as an example, is our own product. So it's a big, big impact already we can make. But I agree with you, when we talk about healthy sales, or when we talk about the pledges on, on the other areas, in the end you have to make those pledges for your total store because you do not care that much if it's a private label or, or, or a national brand uh, item. So we're working on this now together with US colleagues also to see can we broaden the pledges beyond private label and shouldn't we, when we talk about healthy sales, shouldn't that be not valid for the total store irrespective of which brand you buy? We're working on those kind of things, more to, be, no, more to come. Uh, and if, if we have a Nutri-Score uh, indication on healthy sales on all our products, which, which is growing to be the case, and I think that, that work is also getting easier to have with you also the communication as a customer. So 
coming up. Great question, because in the end, uh, healthy sales is throughout your total assortment. That should be the pledge, that should be the plan. And uh, just for curiosity, uh, you, uh, I was wondering if you have any insight in this Albert Heijn pledge. If uh, the 45% production, does that also only adhere to their own brand products, or is that... No, no, that's, that's scope free. So that's no. all of the farmers. So supply chains for all of your products? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's, that's pretty strong statement. Albert Heijn, of course, as a front runner in our total company. Um, but uh, they feel that they, they have to talk about this more, uh, both for, not only for our customers, but also the associates of Albert Heijn uh, find this very important that that company uh, is doing the right thing. And you will hear later from us in November, our own for the total company group, and we have 420,000 associates. So they're also very interested in what we do as a company. They also would like to work for a good company too. Um, do you think when you look at the current uh, way the, the food industry is structured that there is something inherently unsustainable about it? I think the answer is yes on that question. Uh, it's unsustainable that we waste 30% waste of food which has been produced. It's unsustainable that uh, when we talk about biodiversity or when we talk about uh, the way we farm is also not sustainable we have nitrogen here the issue in the netherlands we'll talk about that in a minute yeah. <laughs> so we have uh, co2 as emissions as well that is a big concern and um uh, and we as a company together in this total chain together with our customers we have to make uh, improvements there yeah and there uh, are good there are good examples there uh, which where it's possible you said something interesting about it uh, you gave an interview to um, uh, nrc uh, in august 2021 and you described your customers as creatures of habit um, and that it was not your role to say you should eat this or you should do this um, we were wondering since you a, a big part of your business model is based on neuromarketing, influencing people's behaviors, influencing people's choices. Uh, why is it not your role? It's our role, we think, to help customers to make healthier choices. It's our role to make sure that customers are more informed, healthy, affordable, sustainable. It's not our job to tell you what you should buy. But if I want to make a choice that at all time that warms the planet with two degrees, why, why are you letting me? Um, because it, it, again, it's um, a matter of balance also. We, we don't say to you, don't buy a chocolate bar. Although eating five chocolates bar a day is very unhealthy. So it's also about balance, the uh, exercising, indulgence and, and, and healthy food. What we will do, and this, is, this will come, and we talked about uh, nutrition labeling, that Nutri-Score, but we will also have in the future eco-labeling, talking about the environmental footprint. Yeah. And I think hopefully when we do these kind of things, we inform you what are the right choices, but we will also curate our assortments, that's a choice we can make, on uh, healthier products and more uh, environmentally safe products. That's all coming. That's all we do already a lot. We, we formulate our private labels a lot. We took a lot of fats and salts and sugars out, um, and so do manufacturers, by the way. I think we get a healthier assortment going forward. Uh, we can curate our assortment, but in the end, you're a free person. You can still make your choices. So about this eco-label, um, again, as a consumer, uh, when I go into a store and I see, for example, that the uh, the Seafood Alliance have uh, marked a, a specific kind of fish as sustainable. Uh, for me, it's really difficult to actually trust that because I also know that there, uh, it's very difficult to trace uh, food supply chains. Uh, it's also very difficult to make some sort of judgment on if fish is sustainable in itself, considering the you know, rate we're fishing at uh, and so on. So I was wondering with your eco-label, how can you make sure that this is actually transparent and trustworthy? Yeah. You are a vegetarian, I'm a pescatarian, I dropped, I dropped meat 20 years ago. So fish is an important ingredient for me and I love fish and I love seafood. Our labels, we use the labels MSC and yeah. ASC. And the people in, in having those standards will tell you that is not a perfect label, but it's so much better than having nothing. And those people are very serious folks to, to look at the standardization and the certification. 
On top of this, we have our own rules about FAO areas, where to fish and where not to fish, catching methods. And I think we are very conscious in our, in our total business. We are we completely seafood certified on the east coast of the US. We're the number one seafood certified company in the whole US. We have the best reputation there. And that is not our certification. Those are third parties doing this. So, um, so the labels we carry are so much better than no labels. And we are very serious about this. It's not always perfect uh, because it's not so easy to govern all the fishermen, all the oceans, and all the FAO areas. But MSC, ASC is a much better label than anything else. And the problems of governance also, of course, brings in the third uh, actor that we really haven't spoken so much uh, yet about, which is the government. Uh, and we hear often from companies that government uh, needs to improve their regulation yeah. so as to uh, not have this conflict for a company between being a first mover in an environment and also losing their competitive edge in doing so or you know, disappointing their shareholders, for example. So we were wondering, uh, do you also see a need for stronger government regulation in the sector? Yes, I do see. I think it starts with our own ambition. Uh, as what is our own planning? That's our own conviction. And as I hopefully uh, came across, this is very important to us. But at the same time, governments can help us with regulation to make sure that with what we call this level playing field, that everybody has the same rules, then it's easier to do this uh, because you always have laggards in the total chain. We will be a front runner, we are a front runner, but legislation can help us if it's the European Green Deal, if it's a nuclear score or comparable system in Europe, if it's the CO2 emission targets, if it's the nitrogen targets, and the same for Europe, also for the US. With a market share like yours, you could pay a very good lo um, lobbyist and make this happen. That's exactly what we do. Okay. And do you have an example of which law or which legislation uh, helps you in that regard, or is there going to be something proposed? Uh? No, we push, uh, we push the nuclear score, for example, a lot, which is difficult so far for the Dutch government. They have not accepted that standard, which is for us problematic, so we push that one a lot. Albert Heijn, frontrunner in CO2 emissions, in energy consumption, and the way we talk about uh, biodiversity, supporting farmers, and these kind of things. So we do a lot there to push. and. You might have heard all the nitrogen discussion, and maybe you saw also the discussion with the minister or former minister Remkes on the discussions there. We were a very important discussion partner there. How can we improve regenerative agriculture in the Netherlands? And were you? Yes. You you declined the invitation by Commissioner Remkes. Absolutely, that was the first invitation because in the first invitation, not everybody was around the table, and we said we need the whole chain around the table. Just remember the definition of uh, scope three. So mm. everybody at the table, then we are having a good discussion and in all the follow-up discussions, yeah. if you ask Mr. Remkes now, we have been a very solid partner and Marit van Egmond, our CEO of Albert Heijn, was in all the discussions at the tables and was, and if you look at the, the report of Remkes, he also advised how to work with the farmers in the total chain. Yeah. And I think that example is coming from us, although but it was anonymous. Did you, did you understand his criticism? Because uh, when, when the first invitation was, was declined by all of the supermarkets, he was livid. He said that they are so such a big part of the chain and not taking their responsibility. Did you, did you feel you ma made a mistake maybe there? No, we ma I, think, I, felt, I think we didn't make a mistake. I think we, um, we need to communicate and have uh, be in the dialogue. That's one thing. <coughs> but in the dialogue with only the banks and insurance companies doesn't make that lot of sense. But to be in the dialogue with the food producing companies, the farmer representations, the government, supermarkets and so on, that makes a lot of sense. And you saw also that those discussions got much more, much more traction than everybody was around the table. Okay. Sure. Um, so climate change is of course also a big security risk for global uh, food supply chains. Uh, just, you know, droughts, for example, is one thing that really uh, can become a risk. Um, what role can companies like Ahold uh, play in mitigating uh, this potential existential risk even? I think this is on all our minds. Um, when we see the climate change and the droughts and the floods and the bushfires, and we see this in all our network as well. Um, I think the main thing is that we work on the emissions, and that's what we try to do. But that we also uh, help people um, let's say, uh, dealing with changing their behaviors to also bring that support. And we have to accelerate here 
Um, and if you see the Sharm el Sheikh uh, COP uh, discussions, it's just not going fast enough. So it's up to us now to give the example and be ahead of the game where we can. But so, yet so far, um, Ahmed Deleuze has a 15% uh, emissions reduction target for 2030, sorry. That is correct, right? At the moment, it's correct, yes. So you are also part of these actors that are not moving fast enough. You, know, you, you could argue that we come in, in this November, as I mentioned, with an updated target, not only for two degrees, one and a half degrees. Um, and uh, you will see that uh, I think we are quite well positioned in the total uh, area of supermarkets in this in whole thing, and we are very proactive and progressive there. Uh, you could also argue it's never enough. Uh, but with that percentage now, the 15%, we do three times our own scope one and two contribution. So we contribute three times more in the total supply chain than is our own operation. But I also think that number is not good enough. So that's why we will update this and upgrade that. Okay, I think we're looking forward to that report as well. Yeah, me too. Um, so we want to open up again for audience questions. A lot of audience questions. That's great. I think you are first. The mic. Um, in the response to the last audience question, you stated that you're respecting law, but you're violating international law of war. If you sell uh, tomatoes from Western Sahara or uh, olive oil from the West Bank, then the Convention for Geneva calls it plundering. And you should have asked uh, permission to Polisario and the Palestinians uh, whether that's okay. And you should also allow those two organizations to take part of the, share, uh, of the profit. Are you going to double check on where, for instance, your tomatoes and uh, olive oil come from? Because in the, in the shop we can read Morocco and Israel, which is false. Um, or are you happy with the uh, increased profit? Or are you happy, uh, uh, afraid for boycotts? I would like to understand and see some change. Thank you. Good. Um, yes, we are a company who um, is and would like to be compliant with the law. So I choose for your option one or your option A, checking more carefully when you say there is some doubt about the tomatoes or the olive oil, uh, I will check it. And uh, it's not always so easy and don't see this as an apology. It's not always so easy when you carry hundred thousands of items in, in your assortment, because it's not only the Netherlands but also the US, to know every come every single product where it is exactly coming from when you also buy it through distributors uh, and third parties and import companies. But I take that responsibility to board. I will check that. Yeah, but I think it's it's what we would like to be. We also make mistakes. I mean you can also ask the question, do you know hundred percent sure? That there's not one single product in your in your in your total assortment where um, where human rights are potentially not violated. We don't want to have that, of course. And we have clear rules on, on human rights, child labor, and all these kind of other areas, deforestation. Also. Can you guarantee <coughs> that there's not one soybean in your in your program in one of the products where deforestation is not the case? I think it's difficult to guarantee that, but we will do the utmost with all the protocols we follow to be free from human, uh, free from child labor, human rights. We we report on it. Your origin of the products are we in line with law? Yes or no? Uh, we are a very serious company. I will check that. So I go for option A. Tomatoes and olive oil, you said, huh? Just two examples of whatever is being yeah. uh, plundered. Yeah. Okay. Next one um, with the red hair. <laughs> it's a strange, uh, strange uh, <laughs> identification of the audience, but yeah, uh, you recognize it yourself, that's good. Uh, you mentioned before that you would uh, like to bring me or offer me a more healthy uh, lunchbox than your competitors. Yeah. Um, in that regard, um, where does uh, selling tobacco fit in that picture? And are you disappointed that Lidl Netherlands stopped selling tobacco before you did? Yeah. Thank you. Tobacco, of course, is way away from your healthy lunchbox mm -hmm. uh, and does not fit at all in a healthy assortment. Talking about, uh, coming back to Elias' question, do you take as a company influence on government rules? 
we already talked to the, the state secretary for a long time to block tobacco sales in supermarkets. But we also would like to do this in a level playing field, that all the supermarkets have the same rules. So uh, there are a lot of people coming to our came to our super, or coming to our supermarkets to buy tobacco at the same time also buy groceries uh, buy buy supermarket products, uh, and that's why a level playing field is very important. I'm happy, really happy, that by the first of January 2024, all the supermarkets are away from the tobacco. We are not will not sell tobacco anymore. We were the first company in all our supermarkets to have all the tobacco behind white doors and no advertising anymore. The first one. We're the best recognized for age control in our supermarkets for tobacco. Because there are three big things how to bring down tobacco, um, tobacco addiction. Make sure that young people don't start smoking. Bring down the, the selling points for tobacco, supermarkets and so on. And, uh, and making sure that the price goes up even much more than it goes now. We are a big fan of that in a level playing field uh, uh, environment. What is now happening after the 1st of January 2024 that tobacco sales will go to per mira type of stores and to the fuel stations. I don't think that is a sustainable solution. But also the government will take some measures to also uh, take out tobacco sales from fuel stations between two years later. So we are a big fan. Long answer to the question because it's a very sensitive topic for us as well. And of course tobacco is way from healthy. Uh, and that's why we were the first supporting tobacco sales out of our supermarkets. The government, I will say, was a little bit slow to, uh, to follow the recommendation. Thank you. So, who else do we have? Um, we have a guy with glasses. Uh, yeah, thanks for being here. Uh, I was really happy um, to read today that Albert Heijn um, has this new commitment of 45% um, um, uh, CO2 reduction by 2030. Um, Milieu Defensie and Milieu Defensie Jan have been campaigning for this for a long time uh, and now today you acknowledge uh, that you have a responsibi responsibility there and that our demands are realistic and necessary. Um, it's a shame that it's just Albert Heijn for now, so we're looking very much forward to the plan for the whole of Aholt and we hope it's at least as ambitious um, since you now acknowledge that it's realistic and doable for any supermarket chain. Um, what I wanted to focus on though is that now it's just an ambition for Albert Heijn and we are wondering when you're going to come up with plans, realistic plans and an action plan of how you're actually going to achieve this because these are just words, when is the actual plan going to come? I think the first part of your, um, the first part was more a comment right and the last one I consider to be a question. Um, what we will do is we will also share with uh, the audience, and the audience for us is um, our associates, our people, our customers, but also the NGOs, because we are very much aligned with Milieu Defense or GMA of the targets to say what should we do to get our world in a, in a, in a better spot. So our targets are much more aligned than sometimes people think. But we also have a very serious company. We would like to make sure that our commitments also come through. So we will come up. Uh, we talk about 2030, we talk about 2050 uh, net zero. Uh, that we also are um, coming up with roadmaps so that you can follow how, how, uh, how committed and how clear we are coming to that result. 45% is a high number uh, for Albert Heijn also. A big target for them because it's scope three. So, and that's not only in our control. So we work with all our vendors and with the farmers and with the NGOs and with the consumers to get there. But we will be very specific on the roadmap how to get there. Okay, thank you. Then we move on to the topic of um, uh, the future of food retail. Um, you are an uh, international food retail, uh, retail company and yet for both security and environmental reasons, um, there's a need to move to more, to, to move towards more local pr produce. Um, do you think that in the future we will be able to buy avocado and kiwi all year around? Avocado and kiwi. I think you can buy this almost now all year round. But I think if your if your question is, are we able to buy this all year round with local production? Mm -hmm. That's your question. No, uh, in the future, uh, will we still work with this global uh, supply chain, and should we even aim to do this? 
Okay, so um, there are two, two answers to that question. Um, if you look at our, for the Dutch market, if you look at our total fruits and vegetables, there's only 1% coming in through uh, air freight. A very small share. And we think that eating in the seasons is a very good thing to have. And we also think that eating in the Dutch season is a very good thing to have. So we advocate for this because it's for price better, it's for CO2 better, and it's also for, for healthy and, su and supporting the local farmers uh, a good thing to have. Avocado, by the way, is a great, a great product, but necessarily not so great uh, for water consumption, for example. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, if you would like to have avocados the whole way around, the whole season around, we will target more for local and eating in the season. That's what we also uh, advocate for. Um, but I think to have the variety of products, uh, also with international products, I think is still a cool thing we all uh, appreciate and would like to have. So it will be a better mix uh, going forward. Okay, so um, move towards more seasonality, but still this yep. option to buy um, yeah. kiwi, for yeah. example. 50 years ago, I did quite some research on eco, uh, ecological footprints and CO2 footprints. And sometimes uh, the greenhouse tomatoes in the Westland, which is an area here in the, in the Netherlands, have a higher eco footprint than the tomatoes uh, from further away, which are growing under the natural sun. Yeah. Same for the green beans. So it's very difficult to compare this properly, but eating in a season, I think, is a smart thing to have and still enjoy as eco friendly as possible. Uh, so international products is also a nice thing to have. There are not that many pineapples uh, growing, not that many pineapples and bananas growing in the Netherlands. No. And bananas is the biggest product we have. Yeah. Uh, of course, one reason why we can eat bananas all year round is the invention of cardboard. Uh, a long time ago, one of invention of cardboard. Yeah. One of the OG disruptors in the food industry, so to speak. Uh, and we are wondering, you with your uh, expertise on this topic, what do you think the next big disruptor will be in food retail? Um, I, I think the next, I don't, I don't know if it's a big disruptor, but I think the next big uh, element of transparency in food retail is that we have both nutrition labeling and eco-labeling on the packaging, plus the consumer uh, information, so that together as a force, as a consumer force and as a retailer force, we can make more impact on the total environment by better choices. I think that will be a big positive disruptor. So more transparency along the food supply Yeah, chains. but also informing people that it's quite complex, eh? you have to understand that. In the US we have eco-labels with, uh, uh, with uh, we already have some eco-labels there, um, but I think in Europe it still has to come and I think we have to speed up there as well. Mm. In uh, Rotterdam, you recently uh, at Albert Heijn opened a store um, where co customers can um, shop without buying a package. So they have a uh, um, uh, sustainable way for that uh, in, in Rotterdam. Um, and I was wondering, like, are you looking at rolling that out in the whole uh, country? Um, and and how, wh wh what would that look like? Yeah. Albert Heijn is a great company with more great companies, but now we talk about the Netherlands. Great company for innovation and new things, so testing elements out. If you go to the Gelderland plan here, then you see uh, loose cereals and loose hafel slag and these kind of things to avoid packaging, so you bring your own container and you can load these kind of products. In Pijn Akker, that's a store you're referring to, close to Rotterdam. We have also a few experiments on, call it naked fruit, uh, fruit without plastics. But also, uh, to the colleagues on the tobacco, uh, we don't sell tobacco anymore in Pijnacker and we see what are the effects are on consumer behavior. The Pemira next door has double uh, tobacco sales at the moment. <laughs> so we try to also to do things there. And it's also testing and trying. That's the beauty of retail. Uh, we have 7,500 stores. Mm -hmm. And you can test a lot. You can test in five stores the effect. You don't have to test the whole network. So we keep on testing and we keep on trying. And you see uh, new concepts on convenience and uh, we have now 70 verspaketten, uh, 70 different menus to make sure that for customers it's healthy and fresh and affordable. It's about 5 euros for 3 persons, 2 three, per, two, three persons, so very economical as well. And we do a lot of innovation there, digital, you saw the apps, and you saw the signing in the stores, and you saw the self-checkout. So there's a lot of innovation happening, and we test and try and see what's working. We, we replicate in the other stores as well. So you mentioned um, a little while ago also that plastics was one of your big challenges yeah. that you're facing. 
Uh, and uh, I know that there's a lot of innovation also happening in this space with alternative types of packaging. For example, you have this uh, mushroom-derived or mycelium-derived plastic uh, options. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's also a lot more stuff happening. Do you have any uh, particular things that you think will uh, play a big part in the future in packaging? Yeah, packaging plastic or packaging in general? Okay, wherever I would like to go. So um, I think this is an, an, uh, an industry phenomenon. So when I sit together with my colleague of Fox and Gamble, we say, how can we do make sure that plastic is more harmonized, easier to recycle? And also the elements you like, uh, you mentioned like the mushroom-based plastics, yeah. which are therefore compostable at the same time. Of course, we do these kind of things. I, we have a few examples already, but I do not know by heart exactly which items. But we are very focused on that. We don't want to see plastics. We tested, um, I call it naked cucumbers, uh, because uh, naked cucumbers without the plastic uh, uh, seal, because we don't want to have plastics. Then Corona came, and people say, naked cucumbers, that's not very hygienic. So unfortunately, Corona did not help us. So plastics came back a little bit, because consumers said, we would love to see the plastics. The plastic is on, consume, is on cucumber because we don't like plastic, but it has a longer shelf life, right? yeah. it stays longer fresh. So we do a lot of these kind of things, and if you look at all of hand, you see there more tests doing with naked fruits, naked vegetables, to reduce that smaller films of plastic, that thinner films of plastics, and also uh, compostable forms of packaging. So that it, you, you can count almost there that we will take up every, every opportunity to, to reduce that. We are, I think, pretty modern and front runner there as well. And it's on the minds of our people and it's also the request from our folks in our stores. What are we going to do about it? We have internal positive pressure too. Okay. Uh, well, so, uh, I mean, I'm looking forward at least to see these lighter dressed cucumbers in the store then. Yeah. Uh, lighter dressed is better, <laughs> than naked, better than naked, yeah. Lighter uh, dressed, yeah. I think with that, we unfortunately have to call it a day because our time is up. Next week on Wednesday, we're going to be welcoming the director of Dutch Amnesty on our stage at 3 to 4 p.m. Uh, be there or be square, or be here, rather. <laughs> and as always, you find us on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and we have our website. And the video to this interview and all of our other interviews uh, is on our YouTube, or will be shortly. Then we would like to thank you for being here today with us, uh, Mr. Thank, thanks for having me. Uh, and of course, you, the audience, for the great turnout today. Thank you very much for being here, and we hope to see you in the future. And thanks for the dialogue and the good questions. And uh, we will, you can trust us, we will keep working on, an, uh, on a better environment too. So, uh, and you can keep me accountable to that as well. <laughs> thanks for being here. Thank you.